Oh, so nearby Brad. Are you liking the new setup? It's very professional. It is. No longer professionally unprofessional. Just straight professional now. You say that, but you're constantly looking off to the side instead of looking at the camera. <sighs> Some things never change, mate. Some things never change. There are a few actors as closely associated with the character they play as Hugh Jackman is with Wolverine. A character the actor is now intrinsically linked to, despite the fact he's a clear foot taller than the character is in the comics he hails from. Something they tried to address in the first X-Men movie by making Hugh Jackman take off his shoes. <laughs> so, nearby Brad, do you know about um, uh, like how tall Wolverine's supposed to be in the original comics? If I remember right, isn't he 5'3"? Yeah, he's 5'2", 5 5'3", 5 it varies. But what makes it really funny is that the comics really try and hide how short he is. Like, the comics have never shied away from saying that Wolverine is 5'3". They always say that, but when they show him next to people, he's like a couple inches shorter. <laughs> but keep in mind, nearly every hero he teams up with like, is over six foot. So he should be a foot shorter. And there are a handful of comics that do show how short he is. For example, Brad, if you like to show you this little screenshot here of just Wolverine talking to someone. Who's he talking to? I don't know, just some dude in a bar. And then you have this one where he's at a bar. <laughs> And he can barely reach over the top. He looks like a hobbit. That's the thing, yeah, because I think while the comics will always say, oh yeah, he's five foot three, they never draw him to be five foot three. But for not there who doesn't get what, why is Wolverine so short? One, it, you know, it, it suits his namesake, the Wolverine. Like, you know, an eight pound weasel that attacks bears. So that's, you know anything about like, the actual Wolverine, the creature? Uh, only from previous times we've talked about it. Yeah, well, they are vicious. They are, I think, a member of the weasel family. Um, incredibly muscular for their size, very vicious. Known as being one of the most fearless animals on Earth besides the honey badger. And they have been seen and observed in the wild attacking bears. And there's even one case where, like, they saw, like, this grizzly bear. And then just a wolverine jumped on its back. Which, to me, is a very wolverine move. Because <laughs> that's the kind of thing wolverine would do in the films or the comics, isn't it? When he's fighting like the Juggernaut or something. Bear rodeo, the most dangerous of sports. And we're not gonna like shit on Hugh Jackman's performance because, you know, it's Hugh Jackman playing Wolverine, but one thing about the comics and the games and like cartoons and stuff that I like about Wolverine's portrayal is the way he stands. So do you know like his battle stance? It's like a weird squat, isn't it? He basically, like, yeah, he's crouched down like he's about to shit himself. He's like, Grrr! and he's, he's so compact. Like, this man is just like a coiled spring of chest hair, an adamantium lace fist. And then the film, he just stands up. But if you're a very squat person and your fighting style involves around, like, melee yeah. combat, you would be low to the ground. That's the thing as well of, like, in games and stuff like that. I think the, uh, like, Marvel vs. Capcom, where he's, like, crouched all the way down, like a, you know, a boxer or something. Or, like, you know, a wild animal that's cornered. But also, he's, he's portrayed to be five foot three, so he's like up to some character's knees. Like when he's fighting Magneto, he's just on his knees, and he looks terrifying to fight because all it is is just this like tiny five foot three Canadian man screaming across the stage. Berserker barrage! It looks so dumb. <laughs> I can't stop picturing Danny DeVito. Well, that's the thing. So there's been talks for ages, haven't there, about uh, who should be cast to play Wolverine. And apparently the answer is to bring Hugh Jackman back. <laughs> but one of the casting choices I really liked was Daniel Radcliffe. Because yeah. Daniel Radcliffe is short enough and he's hairy enough. Because that's the thing, you need, you need to be hairy to play Wolverine. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe's really come a long way since his bespectacled wizard days. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed him in Horns. I know not, not a lot of people watched it. Oh, Guns Akimbo. Just, repl just, oh, repl God, yes. just replace those guns with knives on his fists and we're already halfway there. Oh, guns are keeping on. All the promotion of it was just him looking like psychotic with the guns in his hand. Look, this is going to sound really fucking weird, but can you help me? I have guns bolted to my hands. That's the thing. Guns Akimbo, to me, is just like the... Um, uh, it was the precursor to the whale. Do you know that, that film was only ever sold on that one screenshot of just Brendan Fraser going... <laughs> And that's all they used to promote the movie. I wonder where you were going then, when you were like, these two films that are completely not in any way connected, uh, man has guns nailed to his hands and big overweight depressed man. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, like, there's been a couple of like um, actors thrown around to play Wolverine. The other one that I quite like is Charlie Day. He's short enough and hairy enough, but he's too old. And then the other one that I thought was like, an out of left field pick is Michael Mando. Um, he is Nacho in Better Call Saul and Vass. Right. In uh, Far Cry 3. 
and I believe he's also Canadian, and he's ripped his balls. And like every now and again, he'll retweet fan art of himself as Wolverine. He's like, I like this. It's like, make him Wolverine. Yeah, I think the issues with Daniel Radcliffe and Charlie Day is they're not stocky enough. Because you need somebody with, like, that Hugh Jackman but scaled down is what you want. What you need is you need Hugh Jackman from 16-9 into 4-3. Because did you ever see, like, when they announced, like, Street Fighter 6? And just the, the, release, the reveal of Wide Ryu. I'm going to Google Wide Ryu now. Wide Ryu. Street Fighter 6, because like the re initial reveal for like Ryu in that like trailer is he is just he's so wide. Oh dear! And keep in mind in canon that man is five foot nine and weighs 140 pounds. <laughs> and there was like an obviously he just started trending of like wide Ryu is real, wide Ryu can't hurt you, here's wide Ryu. But the theory was, is that they accidentally put him in four, three dimensions. If you stretch him out to widescreen, he actually looks like his physical proportions make more sense. I think it will be the other way around, wouldn't it? That it, they put it in widescreen when it's supposed to be four, three. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, and when you look at it, it's, oh, it fixes his proportions. He's so wide. And he's just, <laughs> he's glistening with just like fucking raw Sasui Nuhado energy. But that used to be a thing. Whenever you would watch a four, three show or something on a widescreen TV, they would have the option to scale it outwards. Why would you ever pick that option? But everyone was just so wide. Yeah, just like, it's, it's like that meme, isn't it? Everyone's like, why poo in? But, you know, so Wolverine, five foot three in the comics, like many characters note it, but they very rarely ever draw him to scale. And when they do, it is hilarious. Um, and he is shorter than near enough every other like mainline Marvel character. And for certain, every X-Men character, including very often the children he teaches. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why, like, you know, he's, what's his most famous move, Brad? Like, his most famous team-up move? Uh, the cannonball. The fastball special with um, uh, Colossus. And the only reason that works is because Wolverine is small enough to be thrown like a baseball by someone as large as Colossus. And I love the fastball special as well because they've done, like, every now and again, just like another character will do it and he's like, whatever. Just, Wolverine just accepts his place, like, okay, throw me. It's such a terrifying idea. We're going to throw a man with an unbreakable skeleton who's like just a wild animal incarnate directly at your face. With huge knives sticking out yeah. of him. Yeah, it's a terrifying thought. I think they only ever do it once in the X-Men live action movies. And I will always be disappointed in those movies because admittedly a lot of the stuff was done with practical effect, but because it was done with wire work, all of the stuff that's supposed to have like, like power momentum looks really bad. Like when they do the fastball special in that, I think it's the third one where they're in the, like the danger room. Yeah, yeah. He throws Wolverine, but because he's clearly on a wire, he goes up before he goes down. Throw me. Now. Damn it, Logan, don't do this! And it's like, you know, like when Magneto's throwing cars and he goes, and all the cars lift up. They're real cars that are really exploding, but they just lift up so lazily into the air. And what I want to see is I want to see Magneto just going, do you like Man of Steel? Like, do you like when like, they throw cars in Man of Steel and they just fly like a thousand miles an hour? That's what I want. You're complimenting Man of Steel? What, like, you know, the physics and the feeling of like, you know, extra, like, you know, powerful beings fight. Or like, um, the Hulk fight in Age of Ultron. Like, do you know, like, they throw the car. Yeah. Like, stuff like that. It, just, it never really feels like there's any momentum to any of like the big action set pieces in that. Like, they did them for real, they just don't look very impactful. I guess I kind of liked it with Magneto's though, because that floaty feeling does kind of fit with the idea that he's adjusting like the magnetism around the object and mm -hmm. stuff. But it would have just been nice, like, uh, have you ever seen the film Chronicle? Yes. Like that bit where they're, where they're throwing shit in that. And I will never like pass up any opportunity to probably talk about one of the hardest I might have ever laughed, ever. And do you remember Chronicle at all? I've seen it recently, but it depends which part you're going to talk okay, so about. Do you remember the bit where like, the, he goes into the convenience store and just steals everything using psychic power? So uh, Chronicle, people don't know, it's a film where a bunch of teenagers get like uh, telekinetic powers. Yeah. Right? And he just steals all the money out of the register. My, I remember when I was sat with my friend, we were a couple of drinks deep, and he just looked over at me. If I was that guy, I'd have done. I was like, what? He went, I would have just used my powers from outside, <laughs> picked up the register, smashed up the entire shop, and then just tried to 
it out the window. <laughs> I could not stop laughing at just imagining that scenario from the perspective of a cashier. If you just stood there and then just the register floats up. <laughs> it's just added it off, smashes up the store to be a dick. <laughs> and then floats out the window <laughs> like a criminal. Oh. You remind me, I, I've recently been playing through Half-Life 2 for the first time. Mm -hmm. And obviously Half-Life is very famous for its physics. And the gravity gun, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I spend so much time in that just picking up random shit and throwing it around. Every, everybody does. Yeah, and I just, in my head it's like, imagine these people have been waiting for this saviour to turn up. And when he finally turns up, he just starts launching shit around. It's like when you watch like speed runs of stuff, and I'm a big fan of speed runs that you can look at and go, okay, if the character was real, this is how it go down. Like speed runs of Doom, where like Doom guy is just flying through an arena at a thousand miles an hour. Do you watch Fever the Dirt League? Uh, no. So Viva La Dirt League are a, I think New Zealand, uh, they do comic sketches and stuff. One of the series they do is called Epic NPC Man. Okay. And it's sketches that take place inside a video game. One of the ones they do is about um, the what a speedrunner looks like who is breaking the game from the perspective of an NPC. And like he walks over, puts a bucket on his head, and then set like fires into the air and fires across the sky. This NPC is like, what's happening here? He's like, you know what? That's the main character. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring it back to like Wolverine when Hugh Jackman, or to give me his proper title, Hugh Jacked Man, um, was um, hired to play like Knifey Wolfie. They were really, really concerned that like that classic thing would happen of nerd bitching on the internet because Hugh Jackman is six foot two in real life. So concerned, in fact, that for every scene in the original X-Men film, they made him take his shoes off. And this is something you might not notice watching the film, but Hugh Jackman says, like, what we had to use a bunch of camera tricks, just similar to like The Hobbit. Yeah. He had to use a bunch of camera tricks, um, have people step on boxers, he's not wearing shoes, and sometimes he just walk around crouched. So they actually did make an effort to begin with of trying to make him look shorter. They did indeed, yes. And it's not really noticeable in a lot of scenes, but uh, the only time they didn't do it is when he stood next to literal children, which only happens a handful of times in the film. And they use camera tricks to do it. So, do you ever see when he first meets Professor X here, look? Yeah. You'll see he's only just taller than, like, you know, the 13, 14 year olds he's teaching. And you can clearly tell, like, something's just slightly amiss with that shot. Because that was done using, like, in camera trickery to make Hugh Jackman look shorter in that moment. And you can see, like, Wolverine not wearing shoes is only just, like, a hair taller than the literal children that have just been taught. And then they definitely just didn't bother in the later film. Well, that's the thing that made it so funny because like the uh, producers were worried that people would complain and then no one complained. So Hugh Jackman said, yeah, after like the second or third one, we just stopped giving a shit because no one complained. Well, there's, there's the famous story that somebody will have put in the comments or that I imagine might be in your article yeah. about him going dressed as Wolverine to Comic-Con. Yeah, we talked about it before, yeah. Just before he was announced as being cast, he went in the full Wolverine costume to Comic-Con. And the only uh, thing anyone said to him is, too tall. Which is just a dick move anyway. Yeah. Like, somebody who's dressed up as their hero, you shouldn't really comment on, like... Do you know what the best bit is as well? I guarantee that that guy, whatever costume he was dressed in, was not comic accurate. No. No. But that's the thing, nerds love to complain, and they love to criticise. And do you know why? Because it's fun. <sighs> is it though? Not really, no. <laughs> should we acknowledge that we've got a new setup, or should we just ignore it? I mean, you did mention it right at the start. But should we talk about why? I mean, you may as well, plug in channels. Okay, yeah, so uh, the reason we have a new setup is because I'm going to be the new interim host over at Top 10's Geographics and Biographics for the foreseeable future. I'm not sure when exactly that's gonna take place, but I've been recording videos for them for the past week or so. And they just wanted a new, more professional looking setup. And fuck's sake! <laughs> still think, but we're still gonna keep things somewhat unprofessional on it, as you can tell by me just waving my hands around like a jackass. The implication that you've got this new shiny setup under the desk are just loads of rubbish, so that's why the flies are everywhere. It's not that, it's just like there's just a fruit tree in my corner of my room, and there's just always like one fly. Now, everybody outside of what you can see on the camera is just mess. The neck beard nest. I'm currently, I'm, I'm sat on a pile of bin bags. Don't say that. People think that I've got the neck beard mess, and I've not. I'm a very clean and tidy person. I it, don't like mess. It is immaculate in here. Except for like my washing, which is all clean and just like on the drying rack. Well, I guess the other thing we like to promote is, uh, yeah, the Fox! Oh! It is uh, it, the live event we're putting on. So this video goes out before the 25th of August, um, uh, 2023. And you are able to make it to the wonderful city of Sheffield. Myself, Brad, Luke, and Nisha will be at the Meltdown Gaming Bar hosting rock band karaoke. Yes, unlike the previous one, this isn't technically a Fact Fiend live event. Nope, but we are presenting it. Yeah, we're just doing it for everyone because it's the, it, we just thought it was a good idea that yeah. more people might want to participate in. So you don't need tickets, you just turn up, 
turn up, have a drink, play some rock band, and uh, chill out with the crew and have a good time. But yeah, go on. So you were mentioning before this, Brad, that you started to get like a little bit of superhero fatigue, and I, f- I feel like I'm there, and I think Secret Invasion did it for me. Yeah, the thing is for me, I don't think it's necessarily superheroes specifically. It's the spectacle that comes with those things, and the fact that a lot of of these um, films and shows and things rely on the spectacle instead yeah. of the story. They always have to end with a world-ending threat, and it's like, can't we just have a story about some characters having fun? So like, I think the best example of that is like the She-Hulk show. Like they, they actually managed to do. They even have the the. That's what turned me around. Like, oh, maybe they realised. Oh, having every show end with a big CGI battle is really stupid because She-Hulk, the character breaks the fourth one, directly confronts the audience. Like, isn't it really stupid how it always ends with a big CGI battle? Fuck this, I'm gonna go complain to Marvel. And she jumps out of the show to go complain to Marvel. This is a mess. None of these storylines make any sense. Is this working for you? The next show they release ends with a big CGI battle. The exact thing the previous show they made was criticizing of them using as a crutch to get bums on seats. We've talked about it, I think we talked about it when you, me and Lucas talked about Secret Invasion, mm-hmm. which may be on the other channel by this point, I'm not sure. There's gonna be so many links below that you can click on. <laughs> you, you will never be rid of me now, audience. Um, yeah, we talked about it then, of like, there's so many opportunities for interesting human shows. Yeah, single, I, w- I just want a single female lawyer having lots of sex. Single female lawyer having lots of sex. Or Secret Invasion from the perspective of people not knowing if their best friend or wife or governor or mayor or anything is a Skrull. Mm. And then we talked about possibly like aftermath of the blip or during the blip when people have just disappeared. How, what happened? It's such an interesting event. It, they it did. Is well, it's such a good excuse as well to get some, like, you know, not no name actors, but actors that are in the movies in. Like, how has there not been? just a series of, like, vignettes of people dealing with the aftermath of the blip. Because, like, every time you hear about someone coming back from it, it's fascinating and such an interesting... Like, when Marissa Tomei says, I appeared in some guy's, like, house. His wife thought I was his mistress. And then, like, you know, she had to deal with the fact, where have I been for five years? Yeah. Or, like, you know, they have that guy who's like, oh, my girlfriend... I thought my girlfriend died in a blip. It's like, no, she just used the excuse to move away. And she took my cat. Or in um, WandaVision. Like, uh, like Rambo's character where she's talking about how, like, oh, she was in the blip, she comes back and her mum's dead of cancer. I mean, even as large as Doctor Strange, who lost his position as Sorcerer Supreme, yeah. like, because the blip removed him. There's so many situations like that. I, I, they could do anything. You could even do one where, because we've had Kevin Bacon appear as Kevin Bacon. Yeah. You could have one where Tom Cruise reappears five years later and somebody else has done the next Mission Impossible film. Yeah, it's, like, it's such a fascinating concept and it'd be so easy to just tell some small scale human stories to connect people to the universe. I feel that's the issue I'm having with it. Of Everything has to be so like, massive in scale that I no longer am able to connect with the characters because they don't, like, I, the things they're dealing with are so... I'm so unable to empathise with them. Yeah, like it felt like they were getting close when they were talking about Nick Fury and his issues. Now he just ran away. Yeah. Like they should have explored that more than the. Yeah, or like I said, like the She-Hulk show, where it's just like you know, it's just law and order with superheroes. That sounds awesome. Like you know, just self-contained, like you know, monster of the week storylines where just something fun happens and I get to hang out with these characters. Yeah, She-Hulk's a great. Um... It's a good palate cleanser. Yeah. Because it's so different from all the other ones. Like, it doesn't end with the big CGI battle and the fact they call it out. But it's also a great forum to explore a lot of the legal issues that come with superheroes. Yeah. It's, a, it's a shame they never hired any legal experts to make the show. Yeah, I have like um, the She-Hulk run, like single green female. Like There's one where like Spider-Man gets sued and then he's in court and he has to prove his identity. He's like, well, I can't. I'm a superhero. How do I prove my... And just like that, it's a question like, how would you prove your identity if you sue a superhero? Yeah, because he has to go on the stand and... So he has to use, like, his like, Avengers identity card and, like, okay, I'm pretty sure everyone trusts this. And then there's one where a guy dies, and but he's a ghost, and they want to, like, convict him of a crime. And, like, well, he's dead, how do you convict him of a crime? And She-Hulk argues, well, she brings in Benjamin Grimm, and she asks him, how many times have you died? And he goes, oh, like, three or four times, like, you know, last year. Do you still pay taxes? Oh, yeah. So what you're saying is like all the rules and laws that apply to you despite having died multiple times. Like, oh yeah, sure. Not to forget as well, we all died in a blip last year, right? And then she will ask the like, you know, the gathered jury, like, how many people on the jury also died? And they're like half of them stick their hand up. And it's like just that's an interesting concept. And I love seeing because they're the questions you'd naturally start to ask as a universe gets bigger and just not seeing them explored in favour of 
fuck it, world ending threat again, CGI battle. In favour of let's you reuse old assets and stick them on uh, Daenerys Targaryen and- Oh man. You're weak. But either way, yeah, I'd love to see more human stories and like, well, we've now got like, you know, a year and a half gap because all the writers and actors are on strike. So maybe like, you know, they'll realise that oh, people don't want to see white giant world ending threats anymore. They just want to experience the universe where the characters they like live.